Y'all, I just hit an incredible moment of gratefulness just, just to be able to worship and to think that one day that will be our normal operation. We just live and wake up in worship and just sing into the Lord, singing, being impressed by God's glory. Amen. Mm. Mm. Well, I guess I can move on from there. <laughs> it's kind of a weird break, but I just had a moment and I had to let it go. Amen. Hey, is Bryce here? Bryce, where you at? Bryce, Bryce. Where? Okay, sweet. Okay, you're already plugged up with the guys you need to be plugged up with. Good deal. I got a truth bomb to drop on you. Yeah, yeah. If you don't believe in this, just disagree silently. If you do agree with this, make me feel good about my statement. All right? Amen. No. <laughs> but here's my truth bomb. It's right here. Trust is built with consistency. You agree with that? You think about it. You put your trust in people who have consistently showed you they are who they are. They've demonstrated the character consistently over the time and the period in which you've known them. Then you can trust them to be them. Even the same thing in objects. We've talked about this several times before. But these chairs, they have for the most part since I've been here for two, almost two years now, have not failed any of us if we've sat down in them. So all of us come in here when we're beginning the service and we sit down with confidence and trust that this chair is going to do what the chair is supposed to do because it has consistently done that. Am I right? So consistency of character indeed allows us to trust in something. Then I want to go to my next statement. Jesus then is trustworthy. Does anybody disagree with that? Good. Good. All right. I know some of y'all are like, if I disagree, do I speak now? No, you don't. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Jesus is trustworthy. This is something that we can easily know, but to live in is a little bit harder. But when we do live in grasping that truth, here's what happens. Our faith is, I don't know what I'm trying to say. No. Our faith is firm. It is a firm foundation that comes up under our faith, and we get to grow, not in our identity in Christ, but because we are fully the righteousness of Christ, but we grow in our application and faith because we truly and completely live in the tr truth that God is trustworthy no matter what's going on in our lives. That is a statement that many of you declared during United when you said, I want to take my circumstance to the cross and operate in a way in which God is greater than because you are walking and believing in the truth that Jesus is trustworthy because he is actually greater than. Tonight, I want to step into the book of John with you, and we're going to actually unpack the faithfulness of Christ. But we're going to do it a little bit different, okay? Because how we're going to be approaching the book of John, we're going to be approaching it this full month of March. And what we're going to do is we're going to interact on Sundays with our 28 days in the book of John Bible reading that we're doing. So what does that mean? That means every Sunday... We're going to figure out what day we're in on our 28 days of John, and we're going to unpack that text, okay? So what is helpful for all of us in here is to be getting in our scripture through this whole 28-day period, all right? Not just reading it, but journaling it, just in the way in the worksheet that we gave you. Observe, pull out a passage, see what is happening in there. Now, I have a true question before we start unpacking John tonight. How many of you have been reading? Okay. Okay. How many of you have been kind of reading but just not consistent? Okay. Okay. Here's my challenge to you. Make time to read. Make time 
to read, right? I'm going to say why later in the sermon, but I want you to make time to read. Make time to get in and jump. Can we do that? No? You can speak. Okay, seven of you can do that. All right. Can we do that? Yes. All right. So this is the first thing you're going to do when you go to your small group. Small group leaders, listen to me real quick. Make an adjustment to the questions. When you get into small groups, figure out for each person, when are you going to be able to read and carve that time out? And each of you in the group set alarms for each other so you can check on that person to make sure they have, you're using that allotted time to do what they say they're going to do. Accountability in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's what I want to happen. So what we're going to do is today, because it's day seven of our 28 days in John, we're going to read, we're going to unpack verses 5, chapter 5, verse 31, all the way to chapter 6, verse 21. And this is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit different because it's not just a, a sermon that's just unpacking a point and stuff like that. I'm going to be unpacking what's actually going on in Scripture. There's going to be a bit of academia in this thing. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to start with a brief overview of chapter 1 all the way to chapter 5, where we're going to start. But first, before I do that, do that, I need to let you know, who is John? Okay? John is an apostle. He is the disciple of Jesus. He is the one who defines himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Right? In fact, if you're looking at John's depiction of what happened when Jesus rolled the stone and rolled away, it says him and, G him and Peter were running to the tomb, and it says this. This is really cocky. The one whom Jesus loved passed up Peter. Right? So one, he, he claims himself as the one whom Jesus loved, like nobody else was loved by Jesus. Two, he's like, I'm way faster than this old guy. John has a particular, deep, intimate relationship with Jesus, and he wants to share that with everybody. In fact, he wants everybody to be introduced to this incredible Messiah, the God that we have, that he has an incredible relationship with and has blessed his life, and he knows he has been saved and transformed because of it, and he wants everyone to meet this Jesus and know that Jesus is the Messiah. Why? Because that is his purpose. His purpose is so that everyone would know that Jesus is the Messiah. And once they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they would have life. That is the purpose of John. That is the purpose of his book. You can find it in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. Now, when he's talking about life, he's not merely talking about eternal life. He's actually talking about the abundant life that you can have within Jesus. And I'm not going to break down what that is right just now because we'll talk about that in another Sunday. But I'll touch on it a little bit tonight. But he wants you to have fullness of life in Christ, eternal and the life that you live now here on earth. So because of that, John's audience is not just merely non-believers, but it is believers. He is writing to Gentile believers and non-believers, wanting them all to believe and rest in the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, faithful and trustworthy, thus they may have life. Amen. So this is what's going on. This is what John is trying to do, and this is what he's going to unpack and show us in the, in the, excuse me, the 20 chapters, 21 chapters of the book of John. I can't remember. I think it's 20. 21? 21? All right. Sorry. That was ridiculous. So let's start with, that was Nick. I know it was Nick. <laughs> let's start with verse 1. Right, I mean, chapter 1. We're going to break down what was happening in chapter 1 to get us all the way to what, was, what we're talking about tonight. So in chapter 1, Jesus is introduced as the creator. He's introduced as the creator who takes part in creating things and now exists with creation. This is the only gospel that talks about Jesus in this way, that introduces Jesus in this way. Excuse me. John is not a part of the synoptic gospels, which is John, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is a gospel that stands on its own. And they introduce Jesus right off the bat as God, the word became flesh, dwelling in tabernacling amongst us. He also says this about John. It says, John 1, 1, 14, excuse me about Jesus, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the son, of the, of the only son from the father, 
So the glory of God dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. In chapter 1, what also took place, excuse me, I need to get my notes out here. Yes. In chapter 1, what also took place, place is you see John the Baptist starting his ministry talking about Jesus and showing, hey, he is the Messiah. He's baptizing and testifying everybody about him, and he's baptizing Jesus, and that takes place. Then in chapter 2, something amazing happens. Jesus' first miracle happens at the wedding of Cana. It's the one miracle that everybody tends to remember. He turns water into wine, which lets me know the church is full of winos. Just kidding. That was actually a very horrible joke. Yeah, thank you for calling that out. Who said yeah, it was? You know what? I did it. I don't need you. No, I'm just kidding. But... It is one of the miracles that everybody remembers. Anything you could say. If you ask anybody, a little kid in church, hey, tell me about Jesus. They'll go John 3, 16, and they'll say he turned water into wine. So you had that take place. And then after that, you see him cleansing the temple, kicking people out because they're selling items of worship to people and making money off of them. And then you see a description of him in John, excuse me, John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, where it says this. And many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all. Now, here's the interesting thing that John talks about in John 1, that he came to do signs that people may believe that he was the Messiah. But right here, people are believing that he is the Messiah because of the things that he is doing. But it says, but Jesus didn't believe in them. Now, here's the thing. It's not saying that they weren't believers. They believed in the sign. They were saved just because this is what John says. They follow the formula. But what Jesus is not believing in is this, is that they are faithful unto death as he is faithful unto death. Because Jesus was coming in with the mission of this, that his word is that I am the Messiah. I am the lamb that will die for you and all will be saved unto me. And he was willing to do this to the point of death. So he believed that they were saved, but he didn't believe that they were faithful unto death in their faith. You go on in chapter 3, and you have this incredible thing takes place where Jesus is interacting with Nicodemus. Well, actually, before I even get to that part, here's the interesting thing. Jesus, and John depicts this in all of his, in his writings. He depicts the idea of believers not merely having eternal life, but living out life abundantly. And one of those ways of being abundant is having life or being faithful unto death. John is the author of the book of John, and then the epistles 1, 2, and 3, and he is also the author of the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, what is transpiring when the, uh, I think the beast is being killed or something, it talks about this, about it says this about the believers in that time. He says, they conquered him in Revelation 12, 11, They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they, did not, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Meaning their lives didn't mean anything to them. They weren't trying to hold on to their lives. They were faithful unto death. They were trusting in the Lord unto death. They believed so much in God being the Messiah they gave their lives up to him and said, if we die because of this, we die because of this. This is what John says. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and you rest in this truth that Jesus is trustworthy, you are not only getting, you're not, he doesn't want to give you an improved life. He wants to give you a new life. And as you sit in that truth, guess what happens? You grow in this faith and your faithful practice and you'll live in such a way that your life does not matter to you. Your faith in Christ does. What does that mean? Worldly possessions will not have superiority over Jesus. What does that mean? It means, and I don't mean this in a shameful way, trust me, because this is going to come for me too. It means that we are willing to make time to sit down in the word and know about God. What does that mean? It means that anytime we want to respond or react in the flesh, we take that to 
to the throne of Christ and we say, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter that I live my life the way I want to. I live faithfully unto death in the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. Thus, I will live in accordance to his will. But this is the life I want to give you. This is kind of what abundant life looks like. Faithfulness unto death. Then in chapter 3, he has this exchange with Nicodemus where Nicodemus walks up and he's like, he's like, look, man, I know you're holy. You're, God, you're godly. Something is up. And Nicodemus being a leader in the, in, in the Jews, he's like, something is up, but we can't pinpoint who you are. Tell us about me. Explain to me. How are you, God? Make it clear to me. And he talks about Jesus comes back and says, you must be born again to understand the kingdom, born of water and spirit. Nicodemus is like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. What is this spirit? And Jesus is like, you don't get it? How do you not understand? How do you not get it? He says, what the spirit is, how do you not understand the spirit? You've been studying the word. To which Jesus then shows and unpacks unpacks to Nicodemus that he is the spirit that was testified of, prophesied of, back in Ezekiel 43. Now, here's the thing. Here's what's interesting about Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43 was written by the prophet of Ezekiel during the time of the Babylonian exile, right? And there was three stages of the Babylonian exile. There was exile in the first very beginning, 606, in which the Babylonians went and grabbed the most beautiful, probably like capable people out of Israel and took them to Babylon, Babylon, right? Do you imagine how it felt? To like watch all the pretty people go and you're like, you're just sitting back there like, oh, that's what you think of me? Like, I'm not, you're just taking the pretty folk? What the, how, I look better than them. How are you taking them and you're not taking me? But that's what went on. Then in the second, excuse me, the second exile, what happened in around 597, they took some others who were smart and prophets. And that's when Ezekiel went. And during that time frame, Ezekiel is writing about the time. The time that the temple will be reestablished because in 586 during the last exile, they just totally wiped out the temple, broke that thing down. And Ezekiel's writing about the temple and saying, hey, one day the temple will be rebuilt and the spirit of God will come up in this mug. And the glory of God will be present. And if you remember in John 1, it says Jesus is the glory of God. And Jesus is trying to tell him, I am the spirit. I am that spirit that is talked about. I am that glory who has come. I am the one who brings life. It is me. The scriptures testify of me and has always talked about me. I'm here and I'm present. And you don't know. How did you miss it? Jesus was all throughout the scripture. So that happens. And then he talks about in chapter 4 where Jesus performs another miracle, healing the official sick son. And then in chapter 5, something else incredible happens. Well, chapter 4, you have the Samaritan woman happening too, and that is a beautiful depiction of someone broken meeting Jesus and Jesus just saying, hey, look, I come to bring you life, not judgment. Then you have the officials healed, son. And then in chapter 5, you have Jesus healing a lame person on the Sabbath, which kicks everything off. That's when problems really start happening, right? Right? Because here's the breakdown of John. You have the setting, which I just went through, and I know it's long, but trust this when I say this won't be this long, only the first one. The next one, I'm counting that everyone has been reading, so I won't have to break things down as much. But this one, I just had a thought in my mind that, you know what, I might need to unpack the situation and get us all up to speed. Was I right about that? Okay, thank you for being honest, David. Everybody else is like, I don't want to say nothing. He's talking too long. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just playing with y'all. But this is what happened. We just went to the settings, and now what we're happening right now, this is where Jesus was having no problems. He's just doing incredible ministry. There's establishing that he is the Messiah and healing people. And now we're at this point where he's healed someone on the Sabbath, and he's, he showed himself that he is equal to God. He said this to the, uh, excuse me, the leaders of the Jews, which are the Pharisees and Sadducees, and these jokers are mad. They're like, one, good. They're like, one, you ain't supposed to heal on the Sabbath. Two, how dare you hold yourself in equality to God? And then Jesus starts defending himself, breaking down different things. 
And now, I'm going to be really fast with this next part. We get into our verses, chapter 5, 31, 6 through 621. Amen? All right. Real quick, everybody stand up. All right. Now, shake it out real quick. Just shake out the look that all of that, uh, shoot, I've been listening to Pastor Brandon for way too long. Get it out your system. Get it out your system. Shake the ankles. Shake the ankles. Yeah, yeah. Somebody give me a little music, a little shake music, can we? Just something, something. Do, do the MacBook? Is, oh, oh. There we go. There we go. All right. Shake it. Are we good? Are we shaking? A little stretching getting in. Get the blood Get the blood going. Get the blood glowing. All right. All right. Yeah, there's a little roof raising over there. I see it. I see it. All right. All right. Yes. I like that. I like that. There we go. There we go. All right. Everybody have a seat. And let's break this thing down. So just roll with me for the next 12 minutes. All right, for the next 12 minutes. Because what has been going on thus far in the setting up is Jesus has been shown to be true, truly the Messiah that you can depend on for life change, eternally and historically as you live it on earth. That's what's been set up the whole time, that this is the dependable Jesus who isn't just talked about right now, but talked about in the Old Testament. So in chapter 5, verse 31, he starts off by saying this, and I'm not going to put all the scriptures up of chapter 5 and 6 through 5 to 6 through 21, because there's a lot of dang on scriptures. I'm just going to go through this thing. He says this, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true, which he's referring to a statement made in Deuteronomy 19.15 that you cannot have a true testimony without witnesses, without two or more witnesses. So he says this, it is not true. There is another who testifies about me, and I know that that testimony he gives is about me, about me is true. So he's talking about the Father right now. He says, God testifies about me, and the testimony that he says about me is true, that I am his son, that I am his glory, that all the actions that I do is because of him. But see, he would know that they're not going to believe that. That's not going to do, right? So then he goes in verse 33 and says this, you sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. So here's my other witness to back it up. John the Baptist told you that I am the Messiah, that I am the Son of God sent to save Israel. You know this. You got it from John. And he says this, I don't receive human testimony, but I say these things that you may be saved. He's like, I don't need him to testify on my behalf, but you need to know, you need to have proper witnesses for me, for you to believe, because I'm here to save you, and you won't believe unless somebody else says it. You won't believe me. But what I'm telling you is the truth, and what I'm telling you will save you, because I've done nothing but prove that I am trustworthy, and that I am the Messiah. And that if you believe in me, not only will you have eternal life, but you will have abundant life. He goes on. He says, John was burning and shining a lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But verse 36, but I gave a greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing to testify about me that the Father has sent me. Verse 37, the Father who has sent me has himself testified about me. Now, when they're saying the Father has sent me, has himself testified about me, what he's referring to is the complete Old Testament. Old Testament. So you cannot read the Old Testament without realizing that it is about Jesus, this coming Messiah that will save from the moment sin transpired and took place. He says, my Father has been testifying over, about me for millennia. He says, you may, have not, you may have not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. Yet you don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. And he goes into verse 39, he says this, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me, but you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. Here's the interesting thing, right? 
I want to break this down. Um, after the last exile, 586, that we referred to earlier, when Babylon pulled the last people out that they were going to pull out, and they completely destroyed the temple, what the Jewish leaders began to do is in substitute of temple practices, they just started studying the word more, and they started determining that for them to have life is to do what the word says. The word would give them life if they just practiced what the word said. So their works and their will would give them life. So they just started looking for eternal life from the scripture. And Jesus is saying, you missed it. The scriptures and your work doesn't give you eternal life. I do. And you were reading and did not see me. And if you would have seen me, you would have seen that over years, over millennia, all that has been testified about is my coming, who I am, what I will do. I am trustworthy to everything that has been said about me. I have consistently practiced the prophecies about me. Look, if you don't believe it, y'all, if you look at Genesis 3, once sin comes into play, it says the women will have a child who will crush the head of the snake and they will bruise the heel of the child. From the very beginning, we get a glimpse of the gospel that will transpire and take place and things that will happen in Revelation when Jesus finally does away with Satan. He says, I am the one who was consistently talked about and I am living up to my name. And I will make this come to pass. You can trust in me. He says, but you don't look at the scriptures and see me. You only see your will. You only trust in yourself. Here's two points I want to give you. We don't know God to be saved. We don't read the Bible to be saved. We read the Bible to know God better. This is what we need in our lives. This is why I'm challenging you to read John 28, John, excuse me, to the book of John for 28 days. Because what happens, so many of us have said, look, I want to have a deeper, stronger faith. I want to conquer these things that are transpired or have transpired in my life and are taking precedent over God's greatness. I want that. But what happens is we're not reading the Bible. What happens when we read the Bible? We know God better and we get to see his trustworthiness. So when we get to see just how trustworthy God is, and his actions historically and even presently, we won't just rely on our emotions or what we feel, but we'll rely on what is true to say that God is trustworthy. Thus, my circumstances and situations do not have me, but his greatness does. That's why I say read the Bible. So that you can know he is trustworthy. The other thing is this. When we reject what is true, we make ourselves susceptible to counterfeits. They truly reject Jesus in the word. And what happens is now they're susceptible to believing what is something else that can give me eternal life. And we do this in our life all the time. When we had a hard situation and we're just like, God, I don't trust you. We open up the pathway for something else false, false to come in and give us life. He addresses that. And he says, you're missing the point. You, if you really want eternal life, come to me. If you really want abundant life, come to me. Verse 41, I do not accept glory from people, but I know you, that you have no love for God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and yet you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept them. Verse 44, how can you believe since you accept the glory from one another, but don't seek the glory that comes from the only God. Remember John 1.14. He says, he is the glory of God who dwells among us. He says, you won't accept me. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father, for your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. It's interesting. Because Moses was the prophet that they all followed and championed. He says, I'm not the one who's going to accuse you. The one that you say you follow behind will accuse you. He says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. And you're like, where did he write about him? In Deuteronomy 8.15, Moses says this. There is one who is coming after me, another prophet. He will lead you, and you need to listen to him. 
Jesus said, that is testifying about me. I am here. Hey, if y'all are picking up on this, notice this, that what it says about God in the Old Testament is transpiring. That means God is doing what he said he will do. Trust is built with consistency. He says, Moses is going to condemn you because Moses said it would be so that a prophet would come. And I am that prophet and you are not getting it. But you don't believe what he wrote. How you will believe my words. And then after that exchange with these Jewish leaders, he jumps into chapter 6. And an incredible thing takes place. Two other miracles to testify of the consistency that Jesus is the Messiah. What's the miracle that happens first? Feeding of the 5,000. And unfortunately, they only say 5,000 because they only took into account the men. But if we were able to look at women and children, it says that over 15,000 people could have been fed that day on two fish and five loaves. The situation takes place as one of the disciples comes up to Jesus, and now I'm speaking paraphrastically because we're running out of time, and you're running out of patience with me. But what's happening is this disciple comes up to Jesus and said, there are all these people here with us. What do we do? How do we feed them? We only have this, and we only have 100. It was 100, 200 denarius, which is like six months' salary. We can't feed all of these people. And Jesus asked them, what should we do then? But he already knew what he was going to do. They're in a desperate situation. They don't know what to do. And Jesus brings them around and he begins to pray over the meal and starts to break bread. Starts to pass out fish and loaves. And he gives it out to 15,000 people. And then after it was all said and done, it says not only after they ate, but after they were full. You know, there's a difference between eating and being full, right? I got a salad today. I ate that salad. Actually, no, the salad's still on my, on my desk. I would have ate that salad. And when I eat salad, what happens is I eat. Now, when I go to hard eight, I get full. I get meat sweats. Okay? I go out of there darn near paralyzed to where I'm like, I can't drive home. I need an Uber. Right? He says he fed all of them until they were full. He did this incredible miracle. He was being consistent and true to who he was, even in desperate situations. And there was so much left over that the disciples each got to leave with 12 baskets full. And then after that incredible miracle, the disciples set out. And they're, they're riding, they're riding across the sea to Capernaum. And it says, excuse me, I've dropped down to chapter 6, verse 17. And it says, darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet come. And they're on this boat in the middle of the sea going to Capernaum. And it says, a high wind arose and the sea began to churn. And after they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming near the boat and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board, and at once the boat was at shore that they were heading with. He does this other miracle. He does another shine, showing that he's the Messiah. He breaks the laws of physics and walks on water. John is trying to show us Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, the glory of God, who has come to save and if you dig in the scripture and if you read, you'll see that he has been operating this way consistently. Trust in him. Trust in him. Because here's the thing. God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. And here's my challenge to you. That you trust in Jesus in and out of every desperate season that you have. Because if you look at chapters 5 through 6, you see this transpire. Why is this thing not flipping? There we go. You have a few different desperate situations happening, right? You have this desperate situation that took place in the Old Testament where the temple is destructed. 
temple destroyed. In 586 B.C. And they're like, where's the glory of God? God has abandoned us. Where's the Messiah? And here in 30 A.D., we're talking about 600 years later, we see Jesus. We see Jesus appear. Then you have this, where there's a need for food. And right away, Jesus comes through. Then you have, hey, we're stuck on this sea and it's scary. And right away, Jesus comes through. This is what we need to know about God, that God is trustworthy. And this is what we need to know about God, that he doesn't always operate on a right away time schedule, but he is always going to do what he said he is going to do. He is trustworthy. So even in our desperate situations, no matter how God responds to him or when he responds to him, let us know and live in the fact that he is the Messiah who comes to save. He gives us eternal life and he gives us abundant life, but we need to live in the truth that he is trustworthy and the Messiah, that means we're walking an abundant life, that we are faithful unto death and not allowing our circumstances to bring us down. Amen? Amen. That is what John is communicating to us. And that is the only way that we're going to take our temple destroyed situations or our sea situations or our food situations. I would read them out, but I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings by saying the things that are written here, but you know it is true. Know that God will show up in any situation that you've placed on this cross. And if he hasn't shown up yet, just sit in the truth that he is trustworthy. And that he will show up and bring life to your situation even if it will take time. Amen. Let me pray. God, I know so many of us are sitting here and we're just like, God, I want a deeper faith. I want to not let things take hold of me. I want to not be yielded to my circumstance, my situations, my my, my thoughts. I, I just want a deeper faith with you. So, God, my prayer is this, that we understand there is a part that we play in this. It is not just waiting for the Spirit to fall upon us and we supernaturally get this amazing faith. In fact, you have already, well, you already dwelt inside of us with the ability to have this amazing faith because of the righteousness we have, because of the work that Jesus has done. But may we realize we need to spend time with you and your scripture that, that we may know you. And we may be confronted by the truth that you are historically, presently, and futuristically trustworthy. God, may we live in that truth and be faithful unto death in it and have the abundant life that you desire for us. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That was not 12 minutes, but uh, amen anyway. Y'all go to small groups.